Hello and let's talk about the state of the COVID-19 pandemic in India. We now have the highest number of cases in Asia. The number of overall cases in India crossed 2 lakh yesterday. More worryingly, the number of new cases being reported is seeing a steady rise. Today morning's numbers show that in the past 24 hours, close to 9,000 cases were reported. Similarly, the number of daily deaths has been over 200 for a couple of days at least. All this is taking place even as the lockdown is slowly being eased in many parts of the country. As we've asked in the show a number of times, what do we do now when the most powerful tool we have, the lockdown, can no longer be effectively used? We talked to NewsClick's Prabir Purkaista on this issue. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So could we first talk about the current situation regarding how the disease has been progressing? Because we do know that India was under a very strict lockdown for quite some time. And now the lockdown is slowly being eased. But we do see that the number of cases continues to stay, rise at a very steady rate. Well, let's look at the big figures first. If we see that when we started the lockdown, we have about roughly about 600 cases. Now, of course, the actual cases might have been larger. But now, as you have said, we have already reached 207,000 cases. And more important than that, the daily numbers is roughly at the, at the moment around 9,000. If you take the world quote-unquote rankings, if you will, so India at the moment is the seventh highest number of total cases. But if you look at the daily rise, then you will see India is jointly third with Russia, both having something like 8,900 cases per day or roughly 9,000 cases per day, only behind the United States and Brazil. So if we look it, at, this, at these figures, the Indian figures really look a little worrying, mainly because if you see that the lockdown has not really effectively been able to stop the epidemic. The epidemic is still growing. And even the Indian Council of Medical Research has said that we are likely to see the peak. We are far from the peak at this moment. We are likely to see the peak couple of months, three months down the line. So we are really looking at an accelerating num in terms of acceleration in terms of numbers, not in terms of percentage of uh, people getting the disease, but in terms of the num new infection that we are seeing. But our figures, the base figures now are so large, 200,000 uh, and more, that these are obviously are quite large in terms of the global figures. So this is where we are. And if we look at the doubling rate at the moment, India, and I'll go to the figures that take us in comparison to the global figures. If we look at the India figures, then you will see India figures at the moment are roughly around 200,000. But this, this figure, when did it, was it half of this? That means what is the doubling rate? You will find it double roughly in the last 14 days. That means India's doubling rate, which is the key figure we should take in the epidemic, is still at a, at a rate which is pretty high. If we look at other countries which are having similar doubling rates, one is Brazil and all others, apart from Mexico, Mexico is a little lower than India, all others like the United States, Italy, Iran, for instance, even UK, all of them seems to have flattened their curves. They have a question of flattening their curves as we talk about this, but the three countries whose curves are still rising, Brazil, clear, India, clear, and at the moment, Mexico too. But Russia has more or less starting to flatten its curves. US has also started to flatten its curves, and the countries which have flattened their curves are Italy, France, Germany, Iran. Now, one may say, well, you know, India is a relatively poor country, but if you look at Malaysia, these are the figures we have been showing from day one, is that Malaysia started a little ahead of India, had higher figures for some time, but after that you can see how well it has been able to flatten the curve, and that's something which is really striking. If we come to the states in India, then only state which has done reasonably well in this period, and even now it's facing an upsurge, is Kerala. And this recent upsurge in Kerala is, of course, because of a large number of migrants who have come from other states already infected 
and Kerala is dealing with that at the moment. But even otherwise, if you look at the figures, you will see Kerala is the only state which controlled its numbers earlier and is still able to provide that degree of isolation support that we need. Now, ICMR and Government of India has been talking about avoided deaths. I think that's a bogus concept because you don't avoid deaths through a long term, you only postpone it. The real key issue where India has been failing is what is called mitigation figures. And mitigation really means the ability to cut down your infections, new infections which are taking place through contact tracing, testing on a much larger scale, and of course, isolating the people who test positive. And all this counts, India is actually in a bad position. Apart from Kerala, we have not been successful so much in contact tracing. Our numbers are rising because the testing is still low. In some of the states, the testing figures are really low. And we therefore do not know what the infections really are. And suddenly we get overwhelmed by new numbers. And at the moment, we still have some capacity in the hospitals to admit new patients. But if the figures double in 14 days, for example, or 15 days, 16 days, even if there's a bit of slowing down, so 20 days, aren't the Indian hospitals in a position to face this influx which might take place? I think that's not really, uh, that's probably not what we'll succeed in doing. And if we look at what has happened, particularly in the last two weeks, not just because of the lifting of the partial lifting of the lockdown, but because the huge number of migrants returning home, oh. and mainly because we couldn't provide support for them in the cities, I think we have ourselves created conditions of spreading this, uh, this epidemic to all corners of the country. And that's not a good situation to be in. Right. So the Indian government strategy has uh, revolved, like you said, primarily around the lockdown and the hope that at some way this disease due to some reason will automatically subside and that has not really worked. So right now, what are the options in front of the government as far as dealing with the pandemic is concerned? Well, you know, what you said is absolutely right. The government of India looked upon this as if it's a law and order problem, not a public health emergency. In fact, three major public health organizations in the country have come out with the statement saying this has been ad hoc, this has been ill thought out, and it doesn't show the, you know, the influence of public health specialists. It's been crafted by people who do math modeling, who don't understand epidemics, to predict figures which are absurd, and also bureaucrats who do not really understand how a public health emergency has to be tackled. So they have made very strong criticisms on both discounts, and it is correct that the government of India's response to this has been what would be called the police response which is what the colonial administration in India used to do, put people in camps, isolate them, lock them down, and hope that the epidemic will die by itself. As we know this time, that's not going to happen. And we are in fact seeing that even if the, what would be called the areas which are hotter and wetter have slower rate of transmission, the point is transmission still takes place in a country like India, there is a packed urban uh, population and our density of population in some of the urban pockets are the highest in the world. So in that case, you are really going to see much more transmission, not because of temperature or uh, humidity, but simply because of people are packed so close together. So that's the, that's the reason. I don't think weather is going to help us too much, given the fact that we already have in Indian temperatures are very high already you're still seeing transmission which is pretty, pretty high, whether it's Maharashtra, whether it's Delhi, you'll see these uh, transmission figures. So I think what has to be happen is the public health figure, public health approach has to be there, which means really focus on hotspots, contact tracing, then separating the people from the other population that is there if they're infected. And the fact that we are putting them back in the homes, means that the entire family is going to be infected. So it doesn't help us too much. And therefore the numbers will still continue to go up. So I think these are the kind of figures that, these are the kind of steps we need to take. But at the moment, lifting the lockdown that we have done, remember we started at about 600 odd. We are now to a more than 200,000. So lockdown does not seem to have 
flatten the curve the way we thought it will flatten. In fact, India's curve still continues to rise. And as we have said, this rising of India's curve that we see is the real cause for concern that India at the moment, the curve is rising at a rate which will mean doubling every 14 days. And this is under no condition a good state to be in. And if we remove the lockdown, relax the lockdown as we are doing, which we are bound to. But we are also allowing, for instance, places of worship, other places, malls to open. So those are the kind of further risk issues that are coming up. And I think at the moment, what we have to look, look towards is how to strengthen the health system, which is in no condition to take the kind of burden that's likely to take place. We have seen the ventilator figures, we've seen the ICU figures, the hospital bed figures. It really doesn't look very good for India at the moment, particularly if the disease now spreads all over the country as it is likely after the major task that the government has created. In our next segment, we will bring you part of a conversation with activist Claudia de la Cruz of the People's Forum in New York. As we know, massive protests have broken out in the US following the death of George Floyd in the city of Minnesota. These are some of the most powerful protests in decades. And Claudia de la Cruz talks about what are the key demands of these protesters. Still the very early days, especially yesterday, saw the protests really spreading to many, many cities across the country. So right now, could you tell us a bit about what are some of the key aspects that are being raised? I mean, I think for the most part, and, and when you see the news clips, when you when you engage with the people on the ground, when you talk to people in the different cities and people coming out, the the most pressing uh, piece and demand is, you know, criminal uh, criminal a uh, uh, criminal response to criminal actions. Like third degree murder is not enough for someone who 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 killed. On, in, someone in cold blood um, it, for the world to see, you know, it was a public lynching. So people, the first demand is that if the criminal justice system does not take it upon themselves to, um, you know, hold police officers to the same standard as regular citizens, this will continue to happen. And, and, and historically it's proven, you know, um, it hasn't worked for them to talk about community and police relationships when these cops continue to brutalize and murder our people and they do not receive the same type of, you know, treatment than, than someone who would kill a white person or will kill a cop, right? It's not the same. The value of life is not the same. So that's the first demand. I think there are a lot of people also in, in the more um, leftist movements that are calling for the ab abolition of prisons and the abolition of policing, right? Um, that are calling for community policing and different ways in which people are able to, you know, be protected. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, because it also needs to be said, um, there's a level of disorganization from grassroots movements and the left in the United States. There's a lot of fractions. Um, it's very fragmented. And therefore, it's very difficult to say that there is a, a, a very clear political demand that is unifying and that folks are all at once kind of coming with this list of demands. Um, I think it's a good start, you know, and I think what we need to learn from previous uh, rebellions, from previous revolts, is how do we position ourselves um, in relationship, in support, in uplifting, in strengthening, you know, the, the cry of, of our people in a way that makes sense and advances, you know, the, the, the political agenda that says we're here to defend life, we're here to defend, you know, community, we're here uh, from an anti-capitalist perspective, from an anti-imperialist perspective, that's work, you know, that folks that have some sort of level of organization that are part of organiz uh, organizations um, from, the, from the left and folks that, that have much more of a, a class consciousness, you know, uh, that's that's the work that that we need to be invested in, and unfortunately, um, I say that, but I also say that there's a lot of fragmentation, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of differences in terms of how do we conceive moving forward. You know, we're in a different place than we were um, in Ferguson and Baltimore in in 2014. People 
people have gone through Obama. We survived Obama, you know. Um, we've we've survived Ferguson. We've survived Baltimore. We've gone through four years of Trump, the the increased aggression of the United States internationally, and the extractivism, the you know, the increasing militarization of police, um, the assault on the immigrant populations. We've gone through all of that, and now we're in the midst of a global pandemic. You know, so we're in a different space. The, the people of the United States in, in, in a different space, so much so that there, there were over 15 cities that were burning last night and people have taken on, you know, to push back on the narrative of riots, you know, and saying that these are revolts and these are revolts from the very historical point of view and understanding that the revolt is the voice and language of those who are oppressed you know, Absolutely. and that they have the right to do that and that their their righteous anger is what will move this country. And so I think it's a great, a, a great opportunity in, in many ways for us to be able to advance our struggles if we have the courage to walk side by side and, and be in, in that struggle um, and, and, and take this opportunity to build the working class organizations that will ultimately move us to another political and, and social uh, reality. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.